Here in Paris, the prosecutor's office said today police have released seven of the eight people taken into custody following the raid Wednesday on the residence where police killed Abdelhamid Abaoud, the suspected ringleader of the Paris attacks. One person arrested remains in custody. In the United States, FBI Director James Comey says he is not aware of any credible threats of what he calls Paris-type attacks or of any U.S. connections among the Paris attackers. At the same time, Comey says the FBI currently has 900 open inquiries into Islamic extremists in the homeland, and federal charges have been brought against 69 people for allegedly supporting ISIS. Joining me now to discuss the challenges of preventing an ISIS attack in the U.S. is New York Times reporter Matt Apuzo. Matt, earlier this week in Europe, the head of Europol said that they have a watch list of almost 10,000 people, that 2,000 Europeans have flown back and forth to Syria and Iraq over the last few years. Now, the number is much smaller in the U.S., and those itineraries, those travel itineraries are like red flags. Does that make it harder for U.S. authorities to figure out who to target? Sure. You know, in the United States, the problem that uh, ISIS poses here is actually very different from what's going on in Europe. The real struggle for American law enforcement and American counterterrorism officials is from guys that uh, they call HVEs, um, homegrown violent extremists. These are people who, you know, they haven't gone to train, they haven't flown out to Syria. They're just uh, disaffected, angry people uh, who are looking to glom onto something. And, and ISIS is out there with a very slick uh, propaganda machine. Uh, they're really speaking to the school shooter crowd. They're speaking to guys who, you know, uh, maybe in a previous generation might have joined a gang or done something other, you know, antisocial behavior. So that seems like a different social media strategy than perhaps in other parts of Europe where they're trying to recruit people to go down to Syria. Uh, this is a little different in the U.S. to try to get them to commit horrible acts inside the United States after they're already there. Yeah, that's absolutely right. The strategy has changed for ISIS. I mean, I think there's a recognition that it's it's much harder to get people onto a plane from the United States and get them to Syria. Um, you know, the sort of wave of people of, of maybe nine a month for the past year has kind of slowed to a trickle. ISIS seems much more focused on trying to inspire people um, here to uh, to take up arms. Uh, and, and if you don't have a gun, use a knife. If you don't have a knife, use your car. You know, to commit these sort of small... Uh, one-off acts of, uh, of violence and, and do it in ISIS's name. ISIS doesn't care. If you want to declare yourself to be part of the movement, they'll, they'll take it. They'll take credit for it, and they'll send propaganda around on it. You, know, you mentioned the school shooter crowd. In your story, there was also kind of an interesting double standard that we have for intelligence agencies of how we perceive whether they capture ISIS or a school shooter. Yeah, that, that's right, and, uh, and it's something that really weighs heavily on uh, American law enforcement. And, and it's a double standard that, that's obvious when you talk to the guys who do this for a living. Um, I mean, nobody had an expectation that uh, the FBI should have stopped the Newtown uh, school shooter or the Aurora theater shooter or the Charleston shooter in the black church before they opened fire. There was no expectation that they would, you know, that they would detect this and that there should have been a trap set. Um, but if that same, if those same actions were done by somebody who had been watching ISIS videos, um, then it, you know, might have been an intelligence failure, and there would be, you know, maybe congressional hearings, or there'd be, well, what, what is the FBI not doing enough, or why isn't our counterterrorism uh, tripwires enough? And that's that's hard. I mean, that that really speaks to what we what we consider terrorizing in the United States. Um, uh, we don't respond in the same way in the United States to a school shooting uh, as we do to somebody who opens fire in a public space and screams Allahu Akbar. And, and that's a hard thing to, to balance when you're in the counterterrorism world. Matt Apuzo of the New York Times joining us from Washington tonight. Thanks so much. Great to be here.